Hello everyone and welcome back to Wonder of Faith. Today we're going to be discussing something quite serious. Today we're going to be talking about evil. So it's only natural that the Wonders Orders uh, talk about evil itself, whether it's through sin or through that which is supernatural, and we'll cover both today. <clears throat> but this doctrine is called the Doctrine of Unbelievable Falsehoods. Uh, and it's, it names evil in this sense because when you think about it, what is evil? Evil is that which is contrary to God and that which is contrary to good. And because of that, it is by nature contrary to what should be. It is uh, an effect of our choosing to turn away from God. And so it is unbelievable and it is a falsehood because sin exists not by nature, but in contrary to it and what the human person was meant to be. <clears throat> and this goes back to original sin, of course, uh, when Adam and Eve um, chose uh, knowledge and chose um, to be powerful over listening to God. And that in turn caused uh, effects throughout human nature and throughout history thereafter, which includes uh, our succumbing to evil <clears throat> and our choosing of sin. No matter how hard we try, we will choose sin. It's uh, part of our damaged state. But through God, through Jesus, through baptism, we're free of that. And through him, we're able to choose good again, as it should have been in the beginning. Um, but it's not until the end of the world that things will become as they should be, uh, perfect and in God. Until then, we're stuck still with this uh, proclivity for evil. Even though we not, may not be evil people, we choose sin, and we choose to turn away from good from time to time. Um, but even when we do, we have to find our way back to what is good and, and, and look to God and for God. So, um, with that said, we'll begin. It states here, In the face of evil, the order stand firm in the grace of God and for his church. No darkness can penetrate these orders, put forth to serve the Lord and better the world. Here we decree that evil shall never prevail in us or in the communities we serve. So when we say it will not prevail, you know, it's the, it's the old-fashioned understanding of winning uh, or losing the battle but not the war. Life in itself is a war. We're constantly struggling with desire. We're constantly struggling with uh, our tendency to want to do what is selfish what uh, is beneficial for us, but what is detrimental to the other. The complete opposite of the Christian uh, virtue, which is to forget about self and think of only the other. We're constantly battling this, this tendency towards selfishness uh, and towards detriment of ourselves and others. And so if we keep God at the center of our life, if we see him as the ultimate goal, the ultimate end, then we can fight against this tendency and be strong enough with the help of God's grace to overcome. But it is um, only with him that this is possible. You know, we may seek other ways. We may seek uh, self-help. We may seek meditation or these uh, kind of secular understandings to, to try to be good. And uh, they may get you to a certain place, but they're not the ultimate end. They're not going to... Um, bring you to that fullness of goodness because our soul was meant to be fulfilled by God. It is the way we're built. And so when we try to, to find other ways to accomplish this goal that are not God, we can only go so far. So if we consider the example of our souls being like an engine and we were made for a premium gasoline, it, it therefore does not follow that we can function fully on a less expensive gas or a different type. We need that, that which we were built for. And that is God's grace uh, and our fulfillment through him and him alone. And so this also has to do with our relationship to evil. So we cannot overcome our temptations. We cannot uh, break free of the slavery that is sin without his aid. And this isn't to say that uh, even with God, we're going to be perfect and not sin, not at all. But we can become stronger over time as we learn, we grow in knowledge, we learn, we grow in experience, uh, we grow in love, that we can overcome eventually, whether it be in this life or after death. But it's only in him that this is possible, regardless. 
But we're going to start with number one, and it's quite a simple uh, decree here. Number one, God is real. And I know in this day and time especially, it, questioning is a part of our reality. It's what we do. And it's kind of natural for us. We want to find out for sure that something is. And when we can't, then why should we believe that it is actual or it does exist when we don't have the proof for it in the empirical sense? And this is valid. It's understandable. Uh, science and itself cannot prove the existence of God. Absolutely. There will never be evidence that God exists 100% where everyone will accept it. And the reason this is, is because then where is faith? What uh, role does faith play if we know for certain God exists? And what happens to our free will if we know that God is for sure out there watching us? No, it requires a different type of knowledge uh, than knowledge from the senses. And this is, of course, knowledge in faith, which is not as accepted by the world. But it does exist, and, uh, and I can tell you this only from personal experience. But through faith, through coming to know God in a mystical way, a way that's internal, not necessarily able to be explained, <clears throat> then you come to know for yourself that God exists. It's And in, in certain ways, it's more certain than the knowledge that the sun's going to rise tomorrow. And that's because it's it's understood internally. It's a part of the being of, of humanity, of the self. And because of that, it's more vivid. It's more real than perhaps an everyday fact. Uh, there is a distinction with truth. There's truth with the lowercase t and truth with the capital T. And this is definitely a truth with a capital T because it is, it is so important and it's existence of truth is at the essence of who we are as human beings. And so you must start on some foundation. And the foundation here is to accept that God exists. There are, of course, uh, arguments for his existence, which the church holds, uh, thanks to St. Thomas Aquinas and others. Um, but th that doesn't always work for the skeptics because they the reason there'll always be a problem with an argument, you know, one way or another. But if you add the aspects of faith necessary to get the full picture of God's existence, then not only uh, do you see him from an intuitive point of view as existing, but even in a natural point of view, by the design of the world, uh, by how perfect nature functions, or how uh, very uh, specific and orderly it is. And so it is with this that uh, we take into mind not only uh, God's existence by what we can see, hear, touch, feel, and so on, but what we can come to know in the reason and what we can come to understand in faith, which is employed by reason. Number two, getting a little bit more narrower now. Catholicism is the true faith in which all truth pours forth. So this is a section, a second understood foundational view. To be a Catholic and not trust the church is quite paradoxical because you cannot be a Catholic who takes what you want to, to listen to or takes what you think is true and reject the rest. No, not at all. If you're a Catholic, you believe that the church is the treasury of truth in its entirety, the holder of the seven sacraments and the true professor of the gospel that Jesus put forth, and that the Pope is the figurehead of this church, and he who represents God on earth until the Lord God returns at the end of the world. These are things that are basic and must be accepted to be considered a Catholic. And so if we're not living in these truths, if we don't see them as foundational or as absolute, then what are we doing considering ourselves a member of the church? It's an all-or-nothing type of thing. And it's okay to struggle with ideas. It's okay to not understand right away why they exist. But it is our job as Catholics to accept them, struggle with them in the reason, but come to understand and come to accept in the end. Because the church is guided by God. Jesus established her with Peter, uh, giving him the keys and telling him that he would be the rock on which the church would be built. And so we have to trust that what Jesus says is true. And that he, Peter, who, along with the apostles, passed down this ability, this authority through the ages, that God and the Holy Spirit are still with the church and are still guiding her to her 
uh, end, which is salvation for all. And so it's a beautiful goal. And the church is a wondrous thing in and of itself. And I love her for what she is. Because I don't think I could exist without her. And I'm hoping that through study, through coming to understand that that can be the same reality for you. Because the church is good and the church fulfills in her sacraments and in her role as being the bride of Christ. <clears throat> so I encourage you to study. Look up if you're having doubts. And see and truly come with an open mind to, to see what the church has to say and why it says what it does. Because in the end, you either believe that the church is uh, the figurehead and the bride of Christ and blessed by God, or it isn't. And the in-between is non-existent. Because if you deny one aspect of the church, you deny its whole. Because it's not, the church isn't some collection of ideas. It is one system that functions it may touch different areas of life, but it acts as one. Its reasoning is one. And therefore, you cannot uh, deny one part without denying the whole. Number three. Remember that Satan attempts to darken hearts through lies and irreligion. So not only does Satan attempt to undermine the church through Satanism and those evil supernatural entities or people that worship him, <clears throat> that oppose the church outright, but the, perhaps the more common uh, function that he, he goes for is making people just not care about religion, just forget about it, not take it into account when they're making life decisions. And that's a very, very popular view in the modern world, that religion is some historical and outdated notion, and that we can come to understand life in our own way, that we are in ourselves our own church, as Thomas Paine said in his Age of Reason. But we have to understand as well that there is more to this world than ourselves. That it, it is not okay for us to try to make our own religion or because I believe this, then therefore I'm right. Or that it's okay. No. There is order. There is a process. There is a body that God guides to ensure that truth is understood in human life. And that is why the church has the magisterium, the teaching authority, that is, the bishops and the popes unite, the pope united together to come to understand what God wishes and what God reveals. And that is the function of the church, to be the voice of God's truth. Even when it's hard for us to accept, we have to come and unify ourselves with that truth. Because truth is, an, is almost never easy. It's hard to hear the truth. And therefore, we want to shy away or make our own truth or our own relative understanding. And that's not becoming better. That's settling for what is easy. And therefore, we have to shatter that mentality that I know what's best for myself. And you may, but when it comes to greater objective truths that have to do with moral understanding or sacramental grace, the church is who to turn to. She's been there for centuries now. And she's undergone so many different obstacles, including those within, such as the evils the church is seeing now with abuse. But in the end, she overcomes. And her ability to discern truth does not get destroyed. Even when the men within the church that say that they represent her fall into sin, even the gravest of sins, the church remains. Her authority remains. Her gentle but eternal guidance is still there. And you can still get good from the church, even while all these things are, uh, all these evil things are occurring. So I ask you to take a look and to see, is evil getting to me? Am I being told things by Satan that are not true just so that I can move away from the church and what she provides? Number four, never tell a lie or withhold information unless the situation is indeed dire. So with this understanding and serving of truth, it's important and understood that therefore we have to let truth reign in every aspect of our life. Even when it's hard, we have to be truthful. I know something I struggle with is I'm on a university campus and therefore naturally there's not a lot of, um, there's not an easy way to proclaim the faith abroad. You know, I try whenever I can, especially uh, with those I can have a one-on-one -on -one connection with. But overall, it's very hard to speak the truth because the, the atmosphere is not um, 
a friend to it. But that doesn't mean I need to stop. That doesn't mean I need to muffle the voice of truth or uh, deny my responsibility to speak on behalf of the church. No, not at all. I have to still speak truth because I believe, and in faith I believe I know, that the truth comes from the church. And therefore, whenever I speak it to others, whenever I speak truth with, truth with a capital T to other people, it in turn moves them in some way, shape, or form. Because if they haven't experienced it, if they haven't known truth in its highest form, then it'll change them in some way, influence them, and perhaps bring them at least a bit closer to Christ. And therefore, I have to take the chance. I can't turn away from my duty to do so. And so even when it's hard, I have to speak the truth. And this even goes for things not faith-related. So I, if I'm caught doing something wrong, I can't lie about it, try to just hide my guilt or my shame. And it's hard at times, but I still have to be truthful whenever I make a mistake and not uh, pretend it doesn't exist or tell people that it's someone else's fault. Because if it's on me, it's on me. And no lie can change that, so I might as well tell the truth up front. Number five, doubt is natural, but remember that one fact cannot deny another. If I hold that truth is in the church, and that truth pours forth from her, then I cannot in the end try to um, counteract that with some truth along some other lines. So, for instance, um, I'll do the opposite way first. So, evolution is a big deal. So, there's a lot of scientific evidence that points to evolution. It's a modern topic. And the church sees this, and it cannot deny the, the truth of evolution, because if there's empirical facts for it, then there's no need to deny it. And so the church is open to the understanding that evolution is a, is a reality. Uh, but going to the opposite, if murder is wrong, and we know this morally, and I think even people who aren't religious know that murder is wrong, the church understands murder to be wrong because you are taking away the gift that God has given of your own free will and ending it for another person. One of the ultimate acts of selfishness and um, bringing about evil to harm another and end life. And it's from this reality that the church knows that, that murder is wrong and not just because it's harming someone else on some generic level. And so it's with this understanding that perhaps those who aren't Christian or Catholic should come to understand uh, this truth. Not only on a general level that harming others is bad, but why? Because the nature of the person that God has given cannot be destroyed by another. Even when it's possible, by doing so we harm. We harm the, the murderer harms themselves by taking another's life. And they, by also harming the person they have killed. It's a much deeper understanding than just you can't harm others. You can't kill others. It's wrong. It's deeper perhaps more truthful because it tells the whole story of, of what's happening when a person does this. And so I think it's important that even when the church looks to science and sees truth in it and understands it, the opposite must also be true. That those who don't necessarily have a religious or Catholic understanding come to understand why such an action or sin is wrong in the first place. Number six. Externally show your, your belief in the church to ignite the souls of others. So I talked about this earlier. It's not enough to be Catholic on Sundays or in the privacy of your own room. But the Catholicism should be seen. It should glow forth from you as a person. Because we cannot be Catholic only at certain times. We're Catholic either none of the time or all the time. Uh, now, there is a, uh, a caveat that is when we sin in a grave and mortal way that we break ourselves off from the grace of God, and we're kind of separate from the church at that point. And it's in those times that we need to uh, go to reconciliation and come to be forgiven. But if, on the other hand, if we're trying to live a Catholic life or call ourselves Catholic, we have to be constant in that. We have to think. We have to know. We have to live in a way that is Catholic, regardless of the situation, no matter how easy or hard it is. Number seven. Satanism must be denounced, and those who practice it prayed for. So, this supernatural aspect of evil does exist. There are curses. There are, there's magic, and not the Harry Potter kind. These are people who call upon evil, Satan, who have given their souls to him in this life. 
even knowing that hell is theirs afterward and get some um, temporary gain from it, some supernatural ability, which is magic, and it's very harmful. It's dangerous. And if one is not prepared or seated in uh, the grace of God, they're susceptible to these harms. And that's why we have to be strong in the faith, not only to be good people, but to, to make sure we're safe against evil's actions. Satan is a fallen angel. And so he has abilities, uh, supernatural abilities that perhaps aren't always talked about. And we have to uh, always be vigilant to make sure we're not being deceived in some way, shape, or form, spiritually or physically. And so we must be careful. We have to pray for those who are taking part in this evil magic or who have professed Satan as their God. <clears throat> And so even if they're not seen often, even if we make joke about it or uh, we may just see it as some fiction, I'm here to tell you it's not. And I know people who have firsthand seen the dangers of this. And exorcisms are a constant go-to when we talk about this. The church has supernatural defenses against evil in the supernatural realm. And so we have to pray for our exorcism priests because they're putting themselves in danger when they go to try to remove a demon from a person. We have to be vigilant and make sure we're not being attacked. Because saints always were. You know, saints have been beaten up by Satan. You know, uh, St. Padre Pio being a prime example. Uh, and these things do happen. Even if we've never witnessed it, you never know. So we have to always be strong in our faith. Because evil can read in on our sins. They know when we're weak. And they'll take advantage of that weakened state. So be very careful, my friends, my brothers and sisters in Christ, and make sure that you have your house blessed, perhaps, or you have blessed objects around, holy water for sure, uh, and that your faith is strong, that your doubt is not uh, consuming you, because that leaves your, your door open for evil to take advantage. Number eight, when evil is present, defend your soul through prayer, sacramentals, and the Benedictine cross as you await the will of God. So you may find yourself in a situation where evil is not only uh, working against you, but is actually present. Some, some demon or some entity that is of evil. And usually the presence can be felt, this darkness, this hopelessness, the void, the absence of God's uh, holy love is is pretty much how to describe the state of evil when it's present. And so we have to hold on to what we believe in. We have to hold on to that which provides for us, and that's God, the sacraments, and those symbols of God, like the sacramentals. I'm, I'm sporting here a Benedictine uh, cross, which is it's the crucifix of, of Christ, and it's the medal of St. Benedict. And the medal has been known in the past to be quite helpful against the presence of evil. So it's always good to perhaps have it in your home or even wear one if you like, uh, to have it blessed as well. And we have the scapular, which is a Marian devotion. Um, it was said that those who wear it will uh, be protected by Mary in a very special way. And if you live a good life, then you will be given the rewards of eternal life. Um, and it's through Mary's intercession. Uh, and always Mary is an intercessor. Never is she deified in and of herself. Because her grace comes from God. She constantly reflects the grace of God. That is what why she is the greatest saint. Because she so perfectly is able to have God shine through her. While she realizes she is nothing without God. And so through her intercession, I wear the scapular. It's usually worn under the clothes. But I wear it externally because people ask me about it. And I can tell them what the, what the scapular is. And perhaps they'll get one for themselves. So it's just these type of things. Holy water as well. Holy salt. There are so many things. Um, just as symbols of the faith. That's what they are. They're symbols. And even though they're physical objects, they have that underlie them uh, some knowing of God's grace. And it's this blessed understanding that they represent that is powerful. And, and in of itself is able to ward off evil. And it's, it's a, a exercising of faith. I have faith in God. In his saving mercy. And because I do, I wear these objects of faith. And it's through that knowing, it's through that faith, exercise, that they have power. Not because of, of what they are or what I see them as, so to speak. But there's a spiritual reality 
that uh, comes with them that makes them able to be defensive against the evil and darkness in the world. Number nine, do not discriminate against other faiths, but do not be convinced by their allure. So in this day and time, there are so many other faiths that uh, we come in contact, contact to, not just Christians, but also, you know, Eastern religions, uh, the other two Abrahamic religions, Judaism and Islam. And so we as Catholics see them as having partial understanding of truth, that within them all there are some fragments of truth, but it is never the full truth. Only in the Catholic faith is truth in its fullness. And even when we interact with others um, who profess to, to be a part of different faiths, we have to be kind, we have to be understanding, but we cannot allow them to convince us um, to go against our own truth, the truth that we have come to know in God. And so always be guarded to an extent. Be kind, be courteous, but always know your place as a member of the faithful. Number 10. Be closely aware and vigilant in locating the deceptions of Satan in your own life. So we all have weaknesses. We all have those areas of our life that we must improve to become better. Because we develop sins, and sometimes they're habitual. And it's our job to reach out to God and cry to Him as lost souls for His strength so that we can come to over to defeat these sins that we constantly give in to. They could be small, they could be big, um, and it's the big ones we have to worry about uh, up front. But in the end, that's the life's journey, to become more perfect, more closer to God. Because sin obstructs our ability to do so, we have to break the chains that bind us and become closer to God. And it may not be right away. It'll take time for sure. But with vigilance, with faith, with determination, we can become our better selves and do it through God and not through some a means of our, of our own will. Because that's a menagerie these days that we can overcome only if we're strong enough, you know. And we're never strong enough because we're broken. We're susceptible to sin. And we need Him and Him alone to save us. And that's where the sacraments come in. Reconciliation, extreme unction, or anointing of the sick as it's known these days. Um, and the Eucharist, of course, all give us these strength, these graces to overcome. And that's why we need to frequent them as well and, and take part in the life of the church. Because through that understanding and communal bond, we can be better. And number 11. Frequent the sacrament of reconciliation in order to more strongly resist the near occasion of sin. So reconciliation in and of itself is a defense against evil. Because we are literally freeing ourselves of its influence when we do so. The hold that our sins have on us and the weakness that our soul has undergone through sinful action is erased and we're like born anew because we're sinless again and we're we may sin <clears throat> going forward but we have this grace that allows us to to be stronger and to not sin as often um and, and a very important aspect is avoiding the near occasion of sin so what does this mean it means avoiding those situations that may allow us to sin more easily so if you sin by gossiping, then uh, if you enter a conversation, make sure that no one is talking about someone else. Change the conversation. Keep it cordial. Keep it good. and Or otherwise, your temptation may cause you to fall. So by avoiding this near occasion, we're keeping ourselves in a state of grace and we're defending ourselves from the sins that we are susceptible to commit. So... Uh, We've now reached the end, but the main thing I want to drive home is evil is most certainly real. And let no one convince you otherwise, because that's also a work of Satan. If you don't think evil exists, then you're not going to worry about overcoming it. But you, you must know that there's some part of you that's weak, that's broken, that's unable to be fixed, and it, I'm sure it saddens you as much as it saddens me because I know it's true of myself. But in the joy of, of God saving uh, saving grace <clears throat> and through the sacrifice of, of the, uh, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, we know that it is possible for us to rise above it, to be our actual good selves. Because God knows who we could be, what perfect Anthony is like, what perfect you is like. 
And if we come to understand who that is and work toward our perfect self, work toward it and, and trust in God only and just give it to Him, then we can succeed. I have faith that that's possible. Even when I fall, I know it is still possible for me to overcome. If only I trust enough and I realize my, my small person in response to the great glory and, and strength that is God. So think about that, my friends. Come to understand who God sees you as, what his plan is for you, and then evil has, will have no hold on you. Satan can do nothing because you have chosen God. You've chosen to overcome. And he cannot drag you down to the depths of hell with him as he wants to because you are too strong. You have made yourself a true child of God. So uh, I'll be hoping and praying that this can be achieved for you and for me. Um, this has been uh, quite a journey through the order of passion. So talking about identity and what it means to be a person of God and overcoming evil is definitely a part of that. And we'll talk further about uh, this next time in our last uh, doctrine of passion. And so I hope you're well. Uh, I've been praying for you. And I'll have the link to the wondrous orders below. Feel free to contact me on Facebook or um, uh, here below the video. Leave questions if you'd like, because I'd really love to have a dialogue. Uh, and so uh, I'll be praying for you all. And may you find final victory in Christ.